Good morning, everybody. Uh, <coughs> welcome to the session, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yasuo Oda with Nikkei, a Nikkei newspaper of Japanese media. And today we're going to talk about uh, startups in the digital field. I am pleased to introduce my friend, uh, Paul Berger, from the US, Silicon Valley, but best in Singapore, right? No, I mean, I spend a lot of time there. I I right. pretty much jump between Silicon Valley, Southeast Asia, and actually spend a lot of time in Africa as well, too. But your hairstyle is still like a Silicon Valley style, yes, right? Yes, I try That's to keep good. it that way, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Mark uh, Valentini is, has an Italian name, but you are German, and you're right. executive in the Siemens. We'll get it in uh, Bangkok, right? Correct. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. Yes, okay. in Bangkok. And uh, uh, Tang Ho Ling is uh, the exec co founder of Grav. And uh, also, we have uh, Mr. Rilujo. Uh, well, Patrick is a uh, North Star advisor in Indonesia. Okay, I, in the pre in the pre in, uh, in uh, preparatory talk in, in, in advance of this session, I asked all of the panelists to prepare one or two keywords. What is the most important element or key uh, key uh, factors to boost uh, startups in digital field? Just give me one or two words at the beginning to kick off. Uh, Huling? Yeah, so I usually share this answer whenever anybody asks me about advice on whether they should start a startup and whether they're doing a startup for the right reasons. The first thing I always say is make sure you're solving a real problem. Because there are many startups out there right now who are failing not because the people are not good, um, but because the problem that they're trying to solve is too small. Mm. And it's not a real consumer problem. And thus, when they actually launch a solution, the consumers and the demand doesn't naturally come. Um, so what I would love to urge people to do is firstly identify a real problem and make sure they identify problems that they're really passionate about. Um, and secondly, once you actually have that problem and that you have that burning desire to solve it, make sure you think about the most innovative ways to go about it. In ASEAN right now, we're very, very fortunate to be in a position to leapfrog. Um, for example, with Grab, we leapfrog from you know, street hailing. We leapfrog from radio calls to mobile technology. It's the same thing as if anybody were here right now, how many of us actually have line, landlines for our home phone number anymore? You know how they always used to ask, what's your phone name? Uh, what's your full name? What's your house address? What's your phone number? Nobody puts in landline numbers anymore. I don't even have a line. Exactly. Um, that's because we've all leapfrogged. We've gone straight to mobile because that's the best solution possible. So if I were to kickstart, that's the two I would share. Mm, I see. OK, uh, what about you, uh, Patrick, So um, as an investor? Yeah, so we, um, so we, we have been um, a big invest, investor in this space. Um, obviously, our focus has been Indonesia. But just to put into context, Last night, I called all the Indonesian delegates to brainstorm and ask for a few data points. There are now seven unicorns out of Southeast Asia, three in Singapore, uh, three in Indonesia, and one in Vietnam. Right? But if you look at the characteristics of these unicorns, those three in Singapore are not started by Singaporeans. And their business is not primarily in Singapore. Uh, the one in Vietnam is started by Vietnamese. All the three in Indonesia are started by Indonesians, and they are still run by Indonesians. Um, from the Indonesian context, I also had the uh, startup unit of our Chamber of Commerce. And I have been quite blown away uh, by the startup activities in our home country in, in Indonesia. Um, what Huiling um, is saying, I cannot, I cannot agree more, is about finding the business model um, um, funding to solve big problems um, where there's demand. But for, uh, for, for me as, our, as, as an investor, what have taken me by surprise is the quality of the entrepreneurs. Quality. Uh, the quality of the entrepreneurs that, that, that I see. Because if you look at the um, regulatory framework, the ecosystem, whatnot, there's no question that Singapore today is leading. Um, there are a lot of, there's, there's a lot of money, there are a lot of incentives, there's a lot of government support. But those that are successful in Indonesia 
there's natural selection um, of how they, they, can, they can get where they are today. Uh, Traveloka, um, Tokopedia, founder is with us um, in this forum, um, and Gojek, in which um, we've been uh, supporting since the very beginning. Um, if you look at the um, look at look at these 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 three companies, um, the founders are exceptional. Obviously, you know all successful startups got got, got exceptional uh, people behind them. So, um, um, and Indonesia is a is a big market, um, um, and I would and these people are not protected. Um, it's a free fight. Um, there's no special favor that the government is giving yet. Um, to these um, to these companies, and yet they have become leaders in where they are. Um, so I'll just I'll just pause there. Um, but um, I'm um, I would say that um, in in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, this is really oh, if if there are such thing as industrial revolution one, two, and three, and four, this is really the, the first time that uh, Southeast Asian companies have a chance to compete with global players. They are not afraid of all multinational companies. These startups have, have, are very successful. Um, so um, I think um, you know, we, 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 continue to be, we continue to be excited. And uh, we hope the governments are um, also paying a lot more attention in this space. I think we should talk about the role of the government later and also well, about the leapfrog. And, and as a person who comes from the, the, the big nation like Japan, it's a so intensive uh, regulatory framework and it has a lot of legacy. It's kind of difficult for Japanese startups to, to, to make a leapfrog because they have to drag all the legacies behind them. So let's talk about it later. How about you? Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned you are from. Uh, Silicon Valley. I'm based in Silicon Valley, but I do a lot of investments. We've done over 40 investments in the region. Um, and so for me, I mean, what gets me excited, yeah, there's a lot of quality entrepreneurs here, and uh, people have been learning at a very fast pace. Uh, when I, I mean, even the difference between when I first came and started investing here six years ago to now, like the quality of entrepreneurs has increased. And I think it's because there's been a lot of sharing of knowledge kind of coming together. And actually, what they've been doing now, and I think this is really important, not only here, but all around the world, entrepreneurs actually need to help each other out. Historically, mm. you would start a company, you're kind of huddled up, you're kind of you against the world. But what I'm seeing, and that's worked really well in the Valley, now it's working really well in Southeast Asia, is like people are helping each other out, right? They're throwing events, they're coming together, they're talking, discussing, and this is how you move faster. You can't go by yourself and, I mean, you can, but it's really hard, right? But if you go out there and you're starting different companies, kind of sharing information, you could kind of learn from each other and you could avoid a lot of mistakes. So when we invest, not only are we putting money in, but we're also trying to kind of gather knowledge between all of our startups so they avoid all those mistakes that they made before. And so I think it's also part of the leapfrog effect is like, hey, help each other out and you can just start skipping all those stupid, dumb mistakes you make in the beginning. So, um, but yeah, in general, I think there should be more cooperation. There has been a lot and I think continued cooperation actually make the region go way faster and start helping each other, kind of lift each other together versus trying to pose each other and fight. You're talking about networking yep. of the people. Well, okay. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a people business, right? Tech is, you know, what enables everything, but you have, I mean, when you start a company, there's two or three or four awesome people come together, and they're the ones who make the magic happen. Then they hire the amazing employees. They're the ones who are actually implementing it. So, yeah, it's all about the people. Mm -hmm. And then the technology, what you're doing is secondary. But if you have a shit team, then you're going to have crappy results, right? So you need to have really good people to come together. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you are from the major player. It's a giant in the industry. Uh, how about you? And what's your opinion to boost uh, startups? And you are not startups as yourself, but uh. we are not startups ourselves. But uh, also in Siemens, on a global basis, uh, we have also created uh, startups, and, and we, we even have uh, now created a new company besides Siemens uh, for startups to, to create it, to be creative, to go, I would say, leaner processes, uh, uh, to to give more creativity, uh, and to come up with with, with new ideas. Besides that, what we are doing here in Southeast Asia, of course, we are at the beginning, we have to, to say. And uh, when you look at the ASEAN countries, uh, Singapore is, is, is definitely one of the, the front runners uh, when it comes to, to innovation, educational topics, uh, funding, support, uh, uh, on new innovations, on, on, on the way to the digitalization. Mm. Um, for the remaining countries, I think there, there is still uh, a longer way to go. Um, there are some uh, I would say infrastructure 
uh, uh, preconditions to, to be met. It's, it's an ed educational topic, it's a language, uh, an English proficiency topic, because when it comes to, to, to um, digitalization, when it comes, uh, I would say, to, to the new world, on innovative world, where you have to have the connectivity, where you have to talk, you have to do this across borders. And when you go across the borders, you have to talk or speak in, in one language. Mm -hmm. Uh, this you see in, in, in many of the countries there is a limitation these days and therefore also the government has to give their, I would say, uh, uh, more emphasis on the educational uh, curriculum on the language itself but also uh, to have in every part of, of the curriculum uh, the new innovation and the digitalization uh, considered. Uh, it has, has, has to be in, in their mindset uh, which is not so far in, in all the countries given. Nevertheless, uh, I think uh, you, you see trends. You see uh, that the governments have their vision uh, going towards uh, digitalization industry 4.0, mm. but still um, the entrepreneurship, the support, the grants to uh, universities, and then the transfer of, of, of uh, uh, innovations back to the industry is, is, is not yet established. Mm. Also, what you can see is um, the change and the openness in processes, processes and, and new businesses, how to, to implement it into the market, restrictions uh, covered by security topics. So not, not every internet is free. You cannot enroll in every country uh, your own platforms uh, based on uh, certain regulations and, and limitations. That definitely needs to further develop in the countries. And also one important topic from an industrial point of view is definitely also that standards need to be aligned. Standards between the ASEAN countries and standards, of course, on a global basis that you can, uh, I would say, exchange information and you, you work on, on, on the same philosophy. Mm, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, I think it's Paul, Paul brought in an idea that networking. So the question is, is how to develop network? Uh, you and I have based in Singapore, and I feel somewhat really comfortable to be in Singapore rather than Tokyo, because uh, maybe Tokyo is 10 times bigger than Singapore, but uh, the physical proximity with people is everybody's within the reach, investors, consultants, manufacturers. Yeah. So it is an uh, urban, urbanization trend. It's a, it seems to be a, it's one of the good element, element to to foster the startups. So what do you think? Is there something in common, common, common between the Silicon Valley and the Singapore? And Singapore is, as he said, is yeah. the only exception in ASEAN? No, I mean, like, yeah, having compact kind of, um, you know, density of people together is really important, right? So Silicon Valley, uh, what I love about it, you know, why I moved there 15 years ago is like, I walk down the street and I'll bump into three or four friends of mine and be like, hey, what's going on? I have these kind of very serendipitous kind of random interactions, right? And so, yeah, the more you can kind of encourage that, the better. And so, yeah, in Singapore, it's, it's a hub in some way, so a lot of people pass through. So while you might be sitting there, you have great people kind of always coming through. And so, um, yeah, whenever you have that kind of density of people kind of passing through in any big city, that makes it really important. I'd say Tokyo also, for instance, is picking up there, right? So I was at a conference there last month. I've been there a couple other times this year. And people are passing through more and more. So you want to be in places where people pass through. If you're kind of remotely in the middle of nowhere, it's harder for you to be connected. So it's your job then to kind of plug into the hub versus mm -hmm. being one of the random nodes. Mm -hmm. Hulin, you talked about the, how to identify the real demand in the market. So that means you have to be very close to the consumers, what they really need, what, what technologies are in need, something like that. So what, how do you think, what do you think of the relation between the consumer and technology supplied as you? Great question, and I'm actually going to tie a couple of points to this later. Firstly, if I were to use our example and our experience at Grab, the reason why we started Grab was because we were all consumers. Uh, for a bit of context, Grab started as a company who was trying to solve safety problems with taxis okay. in Kuala Lumpur. For those of you who have been to Malaysia, um, our taxis are unfortunately, were unfortunately known to be the world's worst at right? some point in time. Google it, it's still there, right? Uh, the indexes uh, on Google, first page is all about Kuala Lumpur and what has happened with taxis, um, robberies, rapes, not, not very nice things. Uh, and things that Malaysians had gotten used to. Uh, it's been around, it had been around for many generations, and we had started to take it for granted until 
My co-founder and I said, hey, we have this crazy idea. With the new innovation of mobile technology leapfrogging what was previously available, and our desire to go solve something that our friends and family were, were facing, and myself as, as well. I, I had to take taxis all the time because I was a consultant, uh, and it was not fun. Um, we were the consumers. We understood the pain. And then we went to reach out to the drivers. We spoke to them. We, we chased them down at you know, their favorite hang, hangout spots, coffee shops. We bought them like coffee, roti chanai, whatever you needed. Right? We went to airports, fuel stations, just to understand what they needed as consumers themselves. Because ultimately, in the right hailing industry, it's a dual-sided marketplace with multiple stakeholders, multiple consumers. And what we really need to do every time we think, whether it's a startup or not, any business needs to be based on creating value. And in order to create value, the simplest way for me is to identify what the inefficiencies are. Inefficient. What are the current friction points? Be a consumer yourself. And if you're not in that natural position, go talk to as many consumers as possible. So framing that in the context of ASEAN and, and how we at Grab have been able to very quickly grow from, you know, one product, one city, one country. We're now in seven cities, uh, seven countries in ASEAN. Right? We're in only in, we're in every single country other than, unfortunately, Cambodia, Laos, and Brunei. Right? We intentionally started the company to be ASEAN every single day, and especially in WEF, I'm getting pinged by people. Hey, do you want to bring your technology to this country, this city, and whatnot? It'll be great. It's not that we can't do it, it's because we don't want to do it. Because mm. we know we are extremely passionate about ASEAN's problems. Our entire leadership is from South, Southeast Asia, right? Or they have very close passions to Southeast Asia. We hire local teams in each country. Um, in the Philippines, our entire team is Filipino. Locally in Indonesia, we have an Indonesian team. Singapore, Malaysia, wherever you go, we have people who are very, very passionate about the problems here. And we know that ASEAN to date has a lot of similarities, yet dissimilarities. And what we have wanted to do and continue to want to do is to leverage the best of those strengths. And it's not easy. Every single day we're learning, right? So how do we do that? How do we bring people together? How do we create that network? We do it both as a company, within the company, and then we try to reach out to others as well, because we are in a fortunate position where we can start to give back. Exactly. Right. Nice so for context, like um, technology is is not what ASEAN has been known to have a lot of. Mm. Uh, we've never had the tech giants like, let's say, Ali, Baidu, mm. not even like Google, Facebook. Mm. Uh, we have a lot of great young talent, but they have never had the exposure or the opportunity to go develop mm. large scale solutions before. Mm. So what we are doing is we're bringing global talent to help guide and coach and build our fellow grabbers. What I mean by this is we actually opened offices in Seattle, Beijing, Bangalore. These are R&D technology centers to bring the best global talent who are passionate about our problems to supplement this with the local talent that we have in Southeast Asia, in Singapore, Ho Chi Minh City, Jakarta, so that we can bring the best of the world to solve Southeast Asia's problems. I see. So you're talking about the, the advantage of uh, being in ASEAN is we have the, the big chunk of the consumers. It's growing. And middle income cluster is now expanding so rapidly. That is maybe the, the biggest uh, the advantage of ASEAN, uh, not the technology itself. You can, you can get a technology in, available anywhere in the world. The question is how to find them and get them into the market. Okay, uh, Patrick, uh, when, you, when it comes to the, the, the judging the, the potential of the startups as investors, uh, do you look at the relation to the consumer and supplier and, and, and the technological uh, advantages? What is, your, what is your judgment? So first of all, uh, let me address a point about networking. Sure. Um, for us as investors, what we are trying to do is actually, or we've been trying to do is actually building alliances with like-minded investors across the globe. And having been trained in the US, of course, initially, our tendency was more US and US-centric, whether it's Silicon Valley, to some extent Japan. But what we had found, that is actually outdated. 
um, the, uh, what, what we find to be a lot more relevant is um, building alliances with the Chinese players. Um, what has been happening there is totally fascinating, and they are a lot more relevant uh, to, our, to our region. We are also building alliances with the Indian players. Um, and interestingly, we have also found ourselves to be doing a lot of business with the Vietnamese because we have, um, you know, uh, we have one uh, healthcare company doing telemedicine and to Huiling uh, point, um, there's a shortage of talents, not only from technical perspective, but from experience who have scaled the business to the level that, mm. um, that's adequate. Um, and um, um, our, this, this company of ours actually opened development center in Vietnam, working with Vietnam developers and whatnot. So it's, um, it's really borderless, it's transient, and I think the role um, for investors like us um, is to really help these young entrepreneurs to connect, to get connected, to be in the flow of information and, 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 and know-how and so forth. And that also helps us when we evaluate um, a business model um, to actually map the idea with what's happening in other places, right? Um, and see whether it's been done elsewhere. Um, it's a lot easier for us to make adjustment of the likelihood of, likelihood of success if there's already a model that works elsewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, like it, like it or not, you know, we look at Uber, we look at um, Airbnb, whatnot, and see what's the um, similar, what's, what are the similar companies that are, happen, uh, that are doing that in, in Southeast Asia. Of course, there are some really local, um, local models, um, um, but, but generally that it's, it's a lot easier if we can map that against um, um, uh, global success stories. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that um, there are different types of products. Um, I think if you are a Southeast Asian company and you want to create a search engine that compete with Google, that's probably not realistic. Um, but if you are in consumer-based business, I think being local is exceptionally important. Hmm. Um, and if you are in a big market, um, being local has its own advantages because you are closer to the, um, you are closer to the consumers. Uh, the problems are your problems. You face the problems every day. Um, you know um, the, marketplace, the marketplace better. So we have a, we have a, uh, we have a bias um, toward leading local players. Um, I think these, um, especially in, in, in markets that are, that are large. Um, so that's, um, um, I don't know whether I ask your, ask your question, uh, you know, I answer your question, but, um, but that's, um, that's how we look at, how we look at things. Mark, so you are a giant, it's a big company, and uh, you know, from my experience, I know many uh, major firms like Hitachi, Toshiba, or whatever uh, in Japan, and they come to Asian market and struggling um, to reach the consumers, the market. They have technology in their factory or laboratory, but they don't really know the, the, what, what is real, really de demanded by the consumer. So there's a distance between the, the end user and the uh, inventor in our R&D section, it's getting far and far. And in your case, it's, it's a German company, like Japanese. And what is your view on uh, in, in terms of the relation with the users and the end users? Um, in principle, yes, we are, I would mm. say, a German company, ger German-based, German-founded, uh, but I think we also have done, I would say, a, a, a big development in globalization. Uh, we, we are more or less in, in more than 130 countries in the world. Uh, uh, the, the workforce, two thirds of our workforce is working abroad. Uh, only one third or even less than one third is, is, is still remaining in, in, in Germany. So I think that maybe we have uh, adapted a little bit more than, than uh, some other uh, Japanese firms. Mm. Um, what we are doing is definitely we, we have in each country we have set up our, our teams to, to become, uh, I would say, more knowledgeable about the demand of the country, of the culture of the country, and how to build up the, the, the business. Fortunately, 
well, not fortunately, as I say, Siemens has not, a, I would say, a direct uh, product business any, any, anymore for the retail. Uh, communication has been given up some, some, some years ago. Yeah. So we are going to the industries. Huh? We are going to the industries and um, with, with our, I would say, uh, state-of-the-art technologies, uh, I have to say, um, we, we, we are more or less um, well known eh? when it comes to these specific sectors. You don't, uh, you don't produce a laundry machine anymore? No, um, I all, all these, all these home own. appliances uh, we merged uh, a couple of years ago with Bosch and also we sold that to Siemens. You will still see some brands, maybe coffee machine uh, for refrigerator right. with Siemens on it, but it's not Siemens. So mm -hmm. the brand can be still be taken uh, as, uh, on, on the products, but it's not Siemens business anymore. So we ma mainly on the way of industries, automation, digitalization, of course, uh, in mobility sectors, uh, we are in power generation, distribution, in all these kind of industries we are in. But this is uh, more, more, I would say, uh, yeah, it, it, it's an industry known brand, okay. rather that we have to go out to the retail business, uh, the product business, uh, as you might know from, from, from the past. But there, definitely, I would say, we are working in, in the countries together with, with uh, uh, the consultants, with, together with uh, government. We have our own consultancy companies, for, for example, and, and setups. We have one just created in Singapore for Industry 4.0, digitalization, mm -hmm. where we also can advise uh, companies how to go or how to plan for the future. Mm. So this is, uh, the, um, Patrick was talking about, uh, this is a first chance for the Asians to, to make, to jump in the, this revolutionary uh, phenomenon, the fourth industrial revolution, because this is digital. And uh, the Asia doesn't have any legacy and uh, you, you can jump into the, the, the head of the everybody, right? So digital means something unique in, in, when it comes to your judgment in American investment. There is a bunch of uh, venture uh, of businesses around in Asia, traditional one, making uh, manufacturing small gadget and stuff like that. But the digital, what is the uniqueness in, in, in digital technology? As I think we talk about Asia. Um, there's a, I think there's a separation between East Asia and Southeast Asia. Okay. I think um, historically, Japan, um, South Korea, um, you have the technical and the education systems that allow you to be competitive in manufacturing, in inventions of technical stuff. Um, in, in Southeast Asia, we are behind. Uh, when we talk about uh, manufacturing industries, um, or manufacturing activities um, is still primarily dominated by multinational companies that are operating in Southeast Asia. And in the context of Indonesia, I can say that it will take us a long time to build the um, ecosystem, the basic industries, and also the, the, the technical capabilities by which if, we, if, if the world is, doing, is, is working in a linear way, it will take us a long time to catch up. But this is an opportunity to, to leapfrog um, uh, because in, in digitization, the ecosystem that you need is very different from these traditional industries. And the limit is your brain and um, your imagination, right? And, and, and hard work and mm. um, the hustle and the... Um, so I think um, that's, that's the reason why I, I think that this is really the first time for Southeast Asian companies to be, to be champion. We are not competing with Japanese companies, German companies, with American companies in, 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 in this area. Um, it's really about finding, uh, you know, there's, there's a chance uh, for local companies to be champions. Um, and, you know, um, apart from being an investor, I'm also Indonesian. Um, and, you know, um, one, of, one of my personal passion is to make sure that we help um, local companies in Indonesia to be champions. Um, in, 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 our home, in our home country and also in the region, right? So um, that is um, that what I meant um, by, by um, being able to, to participate. In is there uh, any phenomenal uh, example in Indonesia in the digital field, local uh, startups around uh, Jakarta? I heard there's one uh, application uh, smartphone type of uh, business, uh, I think the clearance of uh, finance using the smartphone. 
it's a, the local startups in, in nature. So as I mentioned to you, there are um, in Indonesia there are three unicorns. Three unicorns. Um, um, Gojek, um, and we have Traveloka. Traveloka is um, is the leading um, travel apps uh, solutions. They are by far number one in Indonesia. Have they become recently number one in uh, in Thailand? And they are also expanding in other Southeast Asian countries. I think they are the first really regional player. Um, don't steal them away to Singapore. <laughs> and the the third one is uh, the third one is uh, the third one is Tokopedia. Tokopedia is a um, um, leading leading marketplace. And then the second tiers, um, there are many different activities in whether it's in fintech. Um, and um, what's what's interesting is that we as, we start seeing Chinese talents coming um, down to to Indonesia because they recognize that the market is big. Um, they, they, they try to find, and then what they do is that they try, try to find good entrepreneur to back or to partner and, um, and get into a, a more advanced um, uh, type of tech product, whether it's artificial intelligence, um, whatnot. Um, in, regard to, um, in regard to what you just mentioned, um, there is a um, pretty robust activities around uh, cryptocurrency. In, in, in Indonesia, we have our Bitcoin exchange. Oh. Um, there, are, there are people doing different kind of things, but it's still quite nascent. Um, the regulatory framework is still a little bit, I would say, um, it's, still, it's still very new. Um, our central bank still needs to get really comfortable for this, um, for this industry to flourish. Um, but um, digital payment, um, is, is happening. Um, um, our company Gojek is spearhead, spearheading that. Um, we have been quite um, surprised by the um, by the traction they're getting in the marketplace. So there are a lot of there are a lot of different things. I think it's it's a very very robust um, ecosystem there. Mm. So Paul, so we found that the digital give us the ASEAN a great chance to make a, a, the leap jump. And yeah, why did you come to ASEAN? I mean, you, you are not abandoning the Silicon Valley, right? I yeah. mean, but the, you, you see a chance here. That's why you are here. Yeah. Uh, would you tell us a bit more about I it? I mean, so my overlying theory is that there's smart people distributed all across the planet, right? Okay. And so um, historically, there's been a problem, you know, where a lot of times you're really just ex you know, missing access to money and missing access to smart people, right? So Silicon Valley, I was lucky. I was born in the right place, right time. I was at the university where they actually, you know, the web browser was created. And so, yeah, I had all these amazing people. And when I started a company, I would just knock on some entrepreneur's door, like, could you give me a tip as to how to build a digital business or something in the tech field? And people would give me that kind of time. People give me their, you know, their knowledge. And they, would, they shared very openly, right? But when I traveled around the world, I didn't see that. I was like, wait a second, there's all these smart kids out there, and they're not getting that access. So I came out here because I saw this. Yeah, really a lot of brilliant people. And it, we're at a time and point now where, as you said, where you don't need a lot of resources. You don't need a billion dollars to start a company. You could get two or three people, hang out there, and you, you start building stuff. And everyone reads the same blogs. There's so much open source technology out there. There's also now these, a lot of these meetups and things happening. So I saw things kind of bubbling. I'm like, OK, so what, what is missing here? And yeah, it was, OK, they're missing access to people who've done before. Like um, for you guys you know, out of Malaysia, out of Singapore, you were a first generation kind of tech entrepreneur here. You didn't really have a lot of people you could knock on the door versus me. I could. So I'm like, well, why don't I just kind of be one of those people who could bridge it and kind of you know, be a conduit to that information, right? But now there's a lot of entrepreneurs like you locally, and now there's going to be this whole next generation that's going to come up. And that's actually when it gets really exciting. So now that there's this base of you know, you know, five, six, seven unicorns in the region, there's a lot of companies that are kind of rising. So anybody who's like 21, 22 years old now, they're going to go out there and be able to glean off that information. And then you get this kind of like whole kind of exponential thing. So every two people come out, there's four, there's eight, and there's also 16, and it starts going like that very, very quickly, right? So yeah, so I just saw a lot of talent here, very kind of compact, you know, kind of density of people. And I was like, why, don't, why, don't, why shouldn't I be here, right? And it's not only here. I'm also in Africa. I'm also doing stuff in Europe. I just believe in general around the world, things are being more and more distributed when it comes to startups and technology. And you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to start a big company. It still helps to pass through occasionally, and it's good to kind of glean information. You might want to raise some money from there, but in general, you could do it anywhere nowadays. And that's why I'm excited about this type of stuff. Very interesting. OK, so the question comes to the point where we should discuss the role of the government. What is the regulatory framework 
to have such an activity and a lively uh, um, in, in the energy uh, with the people and with the youth, young yeah. people, uh, we need the freedom. I went to Shenzhen in China a couple of weeks ago and uh, for the very first time to, to be in uh, Shenzhen and I found really exciting uh, scene where the, a lot of foreign people uh, from the Europe, Japan, and the U.S. come to China because there is a, a, a sort of freedom, even though it's within the, the Great War. Yeah. They have a lot of resources of technology and the fund and uh, just enjoying the atmosphere. So I wonder, oh, this is uh, much more uh, energetic than, than Tokyo. So this is what's happening in Asia. And, uh, but uh, the, the government has to allow to do that. But you are talking about the, the, the government of the Indonesia is still kind of uh, too strict to... to no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. um, the thing about um, all these new um, activities, it's moving so fast. And um, obvious, obviously it's very difficult for the government to catch up. Um, the government of Indonesia is very supportive. Um, there's a very clear recognition that um, this sector, is, this, this digital sector is very important. Um, but if you break it into, into industry by industry, um, we as players, we have to work very closely with the government to help them regulate us hmm. or to, um, uh, to basically um, persuade them to look things certain, in certain ways. But I would also say that um, it also goes both ways. In a democratic um, um, environment, like in Indonesia, there's also um, another aspect that needs to be needs to be, um, that we have to pay attention. When our businesses disrupt um, existing players, um, it's one thing if you do it by innovation, by offering a product that is more attractive, more user-friendly, whatnot, to the consumers. But it's another thing if you dump, dump capital, subsidize the business over a long time, a long time over a period of long, uh, over a long time, and you kill businesses that way. You kill local, local businesses that way. Um, that is something that, that is a serious issue, it's a social issue, and it becomes a political issue. If you sell your product below your cost for one year, two years, three years, and it, it kills um, businesses. I always say this, we have a tire company. We, we manufacture tires in Indonesia. If I start selling my tires in the US today below my cost, the U.S. government will shut me down. WTO, anti-dumping. It's anti-dumping. Right? Uh, but if the government is doing that in the digital economy, they are accused of not being, in, not being open to innovation and, and whatnot. Right? But um, they, are, they, are, they are losers. Um, and in, again, in, 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 a in a democratic society, um, the government has to also pay attention and listen to the voice of these displaced uh, people. And it's, uh, I think there is no, there's no solution yet to this issue. It's something that, um, something that we are still in dialogue, um, but we just have to keep that in mind. Looking at the, 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 the beginning stage of the establishing uh, the Grab's uh, business model at the beginning, I understand uh, so you don't have a service in, in all region in ASEAN, uh, we have the service in Singapore and Thailand. We're in seven countries. In seven ASEAN. countries in, out of yes. ten, right? But uh, did, what is your experience? Uh, there must be some regulatory issue you have to tackle. So like everybody has mentioned, um, everything that we're looking at in the fourth industrial revolution, uh, growth requires change. Change is never easy. And what we realize is we want to bring this change together with all our different stakeholders, especially our governments, especially the people that we serve, our customers, right? Um, and the good news is I think the path forward usually has a lot of win-win wins for everybody. But what you need to do is spend the time to actually go speak to them, listen and align on what the mutual, align, uh, mutual needs and objectives are. And we've done this with every single local government that, that we've worked with. 
uh, and we're continually, uh, continuously in discussions with them. This is why we attend events like the WEF as well, uh, because it's important that we create that dialogue. Uh, we don't operate like other startups uh, where we come in and we say, hey, we know what's best and we're just going to do this and we bulldoze our way through. What we care about is working hand in hand with, with our partners. And the only reason why Grab is where it is today is because we've continued to get support from all our different partners, public, private, our consumers, our passengers, our drivers. Uh, and, and we're very fortunate to be on this path and it's a path that we think is the right way forward. Well, then uh, you have to have a dialogue with the government as well. All the time. So it means you have to go to the government, you, unless they don't come to you to ask to do something. Yeah. And, and that's the important thing, right? It's, it's knowing that when you go into this mindset of creating change, mm. there are certain bits of change that can happen really fast. You know, you type some code and immediately you can release a new release of a feature of a product. That can happen instantaneously. There's other change that requires bringing people along, changing mindsets, defining what's the future. So what we try and do with all of our stakeholders is to understand what is the long-term objective that we all want. And most of the governments that we work with, they, they all want the same thing. They want more efficient transportation platforms right. uh, and infrastructure. They want to make sure that they don't lose billions of dollars to traffic jams every single day, month, and year. Right? They want to make sure that transportation becomes accessible to all. Right? And they want to make sure that more and more people can be employed. These are the same underlying principles in how Grab has grown so quickly from you know, five years ago. As I said, Malaysian startup looking at taxis. Now we're in like 50 cities for transportation. Um, we have multiple modes of transport. We actually have the widest range of transportation options in one mobile app. And that's critical because we know one form of transport is not going to serve the needs of every single segment of the population. Some will need something quicker, more expensive. Mm. Let's say if you're going out for a business meeting, you want a more fancy car. Or some will require something that is more affordable uh, for longer modes of transportation. For example, we came up with something very innovative in Indonesia. Um, it's called Grab Hitch Nibbing, which is the concept of social bike pooling. Because firstly, bikes, two modes of transport are the most common in Indonesia. It's what enables you to weave through traffic. And it's also one of the cheapest, most accessible forms of transportation. And a lot of Jakarta uh, folks in the greater Jakarta, Jabodetabek, um, they travel from outside Jakarta to inside Jakarta using bikes every single day. Why don't we enable them to have a pillion rider behind them to mm. share that cost? every single day. And it's an amazingly innovative product that solves real problems and is, is growing extremely quickly. Similarly, we don't take the same approach for every single country. For Singapore, very, very different. What we've done to work with the local government, uh, government there is to actually bring taxis and cars into one platform. Yeah. We recently lost Jesh Grab. I think you're very familiar with this. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Singaporeans, uh, residents have been moving tremendously quickly over to just grab right. um, 30 days after we launched, we actually have 5 million rides on it. Exactly. Because it solves a real localized problem. And this problem, we cannot, this solution, we cannot and should not apply to every single city and country. Um, for context, everybody who's not been to Singapore and used it, um, it enables taxis and cars to be booked from a consumer perspective as a single service. So you get the, the closest car or taxi at a fixed price. And imagine what the government of Singapore is saying to us when they say, hey, Grab, we trust you enough to go help figure out what's the right price for taxis, which used to be completely metered before. And this is done 100% hand-in-hand in hand conjunction with the local governments. This is the kind of change that we want. Mm. It's positive. It's for the right reasons. And why, why did they say yes? Because they know it's good for all the drivers. Taxi drivers now get access to demand from cars as well as taxis. Passengers get access to the fastest, closest ride in price models that they are most comfortable with, which is fixed fare upfront pricing. There are many other examples I could share, but I don't want to take up too yeah, much. Yeah, I think actually the Grab dropped the bomb into the, the uh, Singapore uh, market. 
and uh, well, Marx, hopefully it's a good bomb. Well, it's a good bomb, <laughs> but uh, it's yeah, bomb. it's uh, it's uh, for the sake of the consumer, as the price competition is making uh, taking a place right now, and everybody's trying to to renew their business model, even the government. So, Marx, you you said earlier that the Singapore maybe is the only exception in ASEAN that. Uh, can be able to the foster the, the startups. And, uh, but Singapore is known for the very strong government and very uh, uh, strict uh, regulation system. Um, how can you judge that Singapore is a place and uh, it's not applicable to the other cities in, in ASEAN? Um, actually, I did say, say it's the only possible place. Okay. It's, uh, Currently, the most developed uh, place of ASEAN. It's right. the most developed one when you when you see from from the uh, uh, education from the universities and also how I would say the the, the government is uh, really encouraging uh, new startups, new setups, uh, where they even give fundings uh, uh, to, towards uh, these kind of new technologies, yeah? where you get the special uh, tax treatment and, and so on. Um, the remaining country in ASEAN, they're starting to do that. They're promoting, they have the vision, but they're still in, in a, I would say, in, in, in an early stage of implementation uh, to make it as, uh, I would say, successful or, or as advanced as Singapore is, is right now already. So, uh, as I said before, potentials are everywhere, yeah? but you have to identify uh, the potentials and, and, and the talents, and also you have to develop the talents. And when, when you see it um, in, in many of the ASEAN countries, is these days more, um, I say, the obligation of the company itself to hire the people, to train them, to, to develop them, rather you get them out of the market. Huh? Uh, Singapore is, is, is a little bit different, as, as, as I said, than everybody, but, but he knows it because they have started much earlier on, on that. And uh, all the other countries, step by step, in a different level, are starting, are starting to, to, to develop uh, this kind of uh, infrastructure enhancements, visions. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, as, as you said, it, it's a very strong government. I say very strong government also has, has sometimes uh, advantages. That means whenever you have a vision, you have a much faster ability to implement. Yeah? If you have a strong government, rather than, than uh, I would say, it, it needs to go to many, many constitutional processes to implement, to change. And digitalization definitely needs a change. Uh, right. It, it right. needs a change in policy. It needs a, a, a change on uh, uh, processes. Um, it's a fundamental change to the traditional workforce, to the traditional manufacturing, to the agriculture topic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a new way of manufacturing, it's a new way of, of uh, uh, business, uh, which requires changes in all aspects. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can share an experience sure. a little bit in Indonesia. So there's actually a role for the private sector to help the government. Um, um, in our system, the Chamber of Commerce, the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce, is mandated by law um, to be the conduit between businesses and the government when it comes to policy formulation and whatnot. So um, 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 our chairman of um, the Chamber of Commerce created a startup unit. And uh, the mandate of this unit is to basically help startups in different segments um, to then have a dialogue with the government. So last year, we held um, with, with OJK, the, um, our financial services authority, we held a fintech festival, fintech conference. And out of that fintech, um, uh, out of that activity, we worked on a regulatory framework for the P2P lending segment, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, and, you know, the, we, and, and we have, um, uh, we have for, for me, I have also the advantage of being um, a more traditional investors. We are quite big in financial services. So we saw that this P2P, if we don't immediately step in to also help the regulatory framework, it may actually back, backfire. Um, mm. the, the, the credit model is still so early, um, we don't have a full credit cycle mm. to determine whether um, the, the, the lending model works or not, the risk management works or not. Mm. And oftentimes what happens is that um, if, there's no, if, if the government doesn't regulate at all, people will go in, they raise money from, from other people to lend to, um, to these companies or to whoever the borrowers are, and it blows up. And when it blows up, the government will come in, 
and then they will be really strict, and they really strangle the whole, the whole industry. So our observation that it's, it's better to go early and try to, try to work with the government to regulate it. Wow. Um, and um, um, FSA, our OJK, had, 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 had issued a regulatory framework for P2P, so they are now legal to operate. I don't say that it's perfect. I think it's still work in progress as the nature of this thing <laughs> it needs to be. It needs to be, it, it needs to be tweaked all the time. But you know, what I want to say is that regulatory is not, regulations are not always bad. <laughs> we, we, need, we need regulations to, um, to protect the industry itself. Very interesting. So we have to learn how to, how to manage the timing and how to, to manage the dialogue with the government as a big issue. I think it's, we should open a discussion to the, the, the floors. And the, does anybody have a question to the panelists? They'll raise your hand and uh, we should, OK. Please identify yourself before speaking. Hello, my name is Misa Matsuzaki. I'm from Tokyo, Japan. Okay. I listed my company in 2004. I went through the same um, fundraising with the angels and venture capitals, all the same process. But the biggest difference is um, those days we didn't have a comp name Unicorn. Okay. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a, a venture capitalist like you from overseas. So the, the, the amount of the money that we could raise was very small. Okay. And also the biggest difference from uh, now, I mean, in one decade, only one decade, oh, I already feel like I'm an old economy people, but the, the biggest difference is that we were not exposed to the fight. Um, I think uh, uh, Patrick, yeah. Patrick used the word free fight, yes. So we were not exposed to the fight with the uh, company overseas. Now you're exposed, the world is exposed to the fight for the overseas. And how do you conclude this fight? Is it by the money you have raised? Or is it the, by the passion you have to the business? Mm -hmm. Maybe, Braja, you yeah. have the idea for that. I mean, yeah, so I, I was in the same place as you. I started my first company in 1999. And the amount of information out there was completely different. And like, if you raised a million dollars, it was like, holy cow, you raised a million dollars. Now it's like, man, eh, whatever, right? Um, so. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's growing. Everything's growing. There's more money coming in, so you have to compete on a global scale. But, um, but at the end of the day, you know, how do you compete globally, right? Yeah, you have to have money behind you, but I've seen companies that have way less money outmaneuver companies with tons of money, right? So yeah, that comes back down to what I said earlier. It's about people and who you kind of put around you, right? And so if you go out there and you execute really well, you hire amazing people and you show tons of passion, you're able to attract good people, you're going to be able to go out there and actually out hustle and beat the bigger giants, right? Mm -hmm. Time and time again, why do startups still even exist? Why doesn't Google, Facebook, everything start every single company possible? Because some small, young, nimble team goes out there with very little budget, but tons of passion and some very creative ideas, and they go out there and disrupt industries, right? So, um, yeah, I think you compete by just pure brain power and hustle. And of course, you have to have some money, but it doesn't really matter how much in the end. I'm sure to have a, like a sealed country like China protected environment like China. So, so you know, the, the, way, the way we look at it is that the traditional way of looking at locals versus international businesses is outdated. Um, you, cannot, you cannot look at it from where the capital is from, right? Um, uh, because you know, in, in, in the Indonesian context, if we define it that way, none of the startup can, can, can grow mm. um, if, we, if we rely uh, solely on domestic capital, unlike um, the, China, the China context. Um, so I think the, I, I agree completely um, that you have to compete on innovations, but I also disagree that money doesn't matter. Money matters. Um, in certain sectors today, um, there are views that with a large amount of money, you can buy the market, become a dominant player, kill everybody else. Um, and I think, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, one thing that um, we have to pause and think back is what are the fair trading practices um, that you can, you can allow. Um, there are certain sectors, again, people are just selling their stuff below cost. If people are selling um, their power generation below cost, I think Siemens would not be happy. Mm. Um, and, and if this goes for a short period of time, you can understand it. Maybe it's a promotion and you know, it's, it's a grabbing market share. But if it goes to one, two, three, four years, it changes the whole, um, the whole dynamic of the, of the country. 
um, of, of uh, there, there will be social issues. Um, so I think you know, I'm, 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 I'm also trying to be, trying to be balanced um, looking at it. Okay, I see uh, one. Hi, this is Michelle from Hanko. I have a question. So other than to be a successful startup to able to raise funds, what would be the quality of the startup that you really look into the, <clears throat> the, the key elements that actually from a big corporation when you want to invest in a startup or now experience being a startup, what are the important criteria to make them successful? Huling? Yeah, um, I'll speak from my perspective on what has enabled us to succeed. And please note that this is a sample set, n equals one. So what has been extremely critical for us is a lot of what has been discussed. Firstly, the idea. Is it a good idea? Does it have a good solution? Secondly, the people. Are they the right people to solve that problem because they know how to solve it and they have the passion to solve it and the ability to execute like no tomorrow? Because ideas at this point in stage where information asymmetry is kind of no longer existent are a dime a dozen. You need to execute, right? And beyond that is that ability to bring people along, not just the first two, people, two three founders, but the ability to continuously hire the best global, local talent at the same time. Because once you have those three, and, and I'll leave it to Paul and, and Patrick to comment about this, and Marcus as well, once you have those three, that's when investors will come. Mm. That's when you see the opportunity and that you say, hey, it's no longer about Silicon Valley. It's about the rest of the world because that's where most of the value has not been created and that's where most of the opportunity is. Money is not stupid, I hope not. Um, and investors want to see that as well. So when we think about what we need to continue doing next as well is the ability to constantly reinvent ourselves, constantly learn, constantly put up our hands and say, we made a mistake. How do we iterate? How do we move? If you have some intrinsics with that, that permeates throughout that group of individuals, that company, mm. that leadership team that you're looking at, that startup that, that you care about, mm. it doesn't matter what happens in the world, right? Mm. It, things will always change. The environment, the industry will always either have headwinds or tailwinds. You just need to figure out how you're going to react to it. What does this mean to you? How do you change a challenge into an opportunity? Ultimately, it boils down to the people, the culture, the idea. Do they have that passion? Are they going to continue fighting in the ring when it's a roller coaster? Um, and do they know how to bring other people, whether it's fellow people to start the startup or continue that startup? or partners, private, public, investors, you name it, right? See. So well, I'll add on to that. I mean, sure? So I agree 100% with also you mentioned something like the flexibility, the malleability of the team, right? So these companies, they change. Like you have an idea, you have a dream, you want to go there. It always ends up somewhere there, right? And you need to find an ex a team that can like roll with the punches, they'll figure things out, and you know, they'll kind of get beat up a little bit, but they won't give up. Also with kind of, with kind of similar light to that, there's another thing I look for, I call it grit, right? Like, Argh! it's like somebody's coming after you, your company's getting punched in the face, people are coming at you, you're running out of money, but you as a founder don't give up, right? You go out there, yeah, you're flexible, you kind of change your path, you go out there, you persevere. If you could see that quality in a person either historically or even in the kind of first steps they've taken as a company, that's a huge sign to me. And I get excited when I meet somebody who I could see is like, okay, this person's up for the fight, they're not gonna give up. Because running a company is difficult and you're gonna have all those ups and downs, you said roller coaster, right? So when mm. there's worse, worse dips, how do you, mm. you kind of persevere? That's a really important part of kind of selecting a team, especially the co-founding team as well. Passion and the flexibility yeah. Yeah. that Japan and uh, Germany, mm. maybe not good at, but... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I disagree. I live, I live in Japan for Did three you? years. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I was telling people that when I was training at Goldman Sachs in 1997, I met this company called Fast Retailing. Nobody knew about what Fast Retailing was. And look at it today, Uniqlo, yeah. you know. Um, and you can see all different type of things in um, all, all of new, new, new economy activities in Japan. I think the... Um, 
but you know you cannot you cannot fight the macro factors in our in our place in Southeast Asia. It's a, it's a growing economy, mm. young population, and a lot of, a lot of inefficiencies, right? So the um, the the hurdle rate to be successful is um, is a lot lower um, um, than than in, in developed uh, places mm. like Japan. So I. I beg to differ a little bit. I appreciate your <laughs> comment. Uh, I myself is enjoying being in Asia, in ASEAN. You know, so, so would you wrap up, Marx? And, uh, yeah, as, I would, as a German, German person. As, as, a, as a German person, <laughs> I, I, I would, wouldn't see it so bad as, as you see that, that, that this is uh, okay. really mature and, and, and not flexible at all. And you see it also in the companies. The, the companies who are globally operating, Siemens is one of them. Uh, you see it, uh, I think, it's not the biggest, it's not the fastest who will survive. It's the one who has the ability to adapt, to adapt to the situations, to the changes. Um, that is, is very, very important. And uh, you have seen it when, when you're anticipating what business we did in the past. We mm. have here and there, I say we go for new innovations, we go for new companies, we, we, we lay off businesses which comes most, most, uh, more or less obsolete or, or not, uh, I would say, uh, any more from our perspective uh, that we can handle it in a successful way. Eh? Because also our mission as, as a stock listed company is definitely to bring, create shareholder value. Eh? We have to give, give it back to our shareholders. Uh, that is why we are ex existing. And therefore, we have to adapt uh, to the market. And that is, is very, very important. And that you can only get, uh, we say, with a new mindset and with uh, connectivity all over the world. You can't operate your, your company only out of uh, one center point like Germany. That is the reason we are spread all over the world. Uh, we have all over the world, I would say, our local setups where we get the market knowledge, the demand of the customers, uh, the visions, uh, what we try to, I would say, then convey into, into a business and a new business model. That is uh, how, how we are acting, and I think that is needed for everybody uh, for having or being successful in the future is to adapt to the new demands, to, to the new developments uh, on a global basis. That's a great wrap up. I mean, I mean, we, we, we all have to know we are lucky, extremely lucky to be here in, in ASEAN at this moment in history and at this, the stage of the development of the technology. With that, thank you very much for everybody and uh, big hands to all the panelists and thank you very much for welcome. Thank you. Thank you.